What? Subscribe. Subscribe. We'll, 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 we'll highlight all that. Don't you worry. Just but saying. You gotta, you gotta remind people. Subscribe you get, right subscribe. now. Subscribe. Subscribe. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Of course. Philadelphia, baby. You're gonna love it. Best sports fans in the world. Actually, the worst, but that's what makes them the best. You know, uh, Scotty Scheffler now has 12 wins dating back to January of 2022. He has more wins since January 2022 than the Arizona Cardinals, Carolina Panthers, and Chicago Bears. Holy shit. Scotty Scheffler could beat the Bears. Surprised wow. the Giants aren't in that category. Actually, eh, they had that one playoff game. That, one, that one playoff run. Surprised the Jets aren't in that. <laughs> that's crazy, wow. though, that he has more wins. And that's just total tour wins. Yeah. That's wild. Sorry. Sorry. I am. Um, yeah. Sorry. Cardinals and Panthers have nine wins apiece. The Bears have 10. Scotty has 12. I also like realized this, um, which I think is is kind of like awe striking. Uh, so Scotty Scheffler is now at this point in his career, he's fifth on the all time money list, and he's only a million dollars and one point three million behind of beating VJ Singh and Jim Furyk, who, for reference, Jeez. golfed a collective forty two years. I, I I get it. Purses are different. Live happened. Golf's just more popular now, and money's more money's more there. But the fact that he's made seventy million dollars in his career in two and a half years of being a true big time athlete is like I mean, shocking. His caddies made more than Jordan Spieth this year. What his caddies? Uh, I think Ted Scott. If I'm not wrong, wait, wait, wait. someone's put this on. Someone's put it on Twitter. I I, I know for a fact. Ted Scott has made probably after this week. Let's see if we have something new. Here we go. Uh, shout out to John Nucci from yesterday. Scotty Sheffler was first on first on on the tour money list with twenty seven point six million dollars in on course earnings. Ted Scott is forty third on on this year's PGA Tour money list. What a life! That guy's making making so much goddamn money. What a lot. Um, Rory McIlroy in 2024 made $1.71 million. Ted Scott projected this year is set to make $1.78 million. Jesus. Um, well, 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 let's just like keep on tagging uh, numbers. Uh, Ted Scott, assuming he makes 10% for a win, 7% for a top 10, and 5% for all, all other finishes. He has more on-course earnings than Rory McIlroy, Keegan Bradley, and Minwoo Lee. Um, th th there's more of these, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, so on, on the all-time money list, Ted Scott has earned over um, $4.5 million, which is most than 96% of golfers in the world. If Scotty Shepard was paying temp Ted Scott 10% uh, of earnings, he ranked 40th on PJ Tour money list ahead of these following names: Rory, Keegan, like we said, Minwoo Lee, Sunjay Im, Corey Connors, Tom Kim, and Victor Hovland. He would actually have made more money than Victor Hovland and Tom Kim combined this year. Damn, kind of disgusting. That's, That's crazy. Not, and like, it's very disgusting. I saw the the post this weekend about Cam Young's 59, which we'll talk about obviously yeah. when we get into the show, but. It was the first 59 since Scotty in 2020. And I was like, it feels like we've been talking about Scotty forever, but also for such a short blip on the radar all at the same time. Well, so it, it, it's funny because the the Scotty Scheffler like train, right? I think when he even shot his 59 9 in 2020, like he had only come on to the golf scene, of course, amidst amidst COVID. And I remember when he was on the term and we did the live show at the Double Eagle when he won the Masters, and I'm like, like this guy came out of absolutely freaking nowhere. Like, how how is he as good as he is? And like, you, you come to realize that, yeah, he's 28 years old. He's been he's been a full four years at college. He still had a relatively lengthy stay on the Corn Ferry Tour. Like, he had to play his way through and figure himself out he didn't just automatically join the pga tour he's technically been a pro since 2018 
but the fact that all of this has happened in a two and a half year period is kind of it, it, it's kind of just the like the icing on top of the cake for what's all for what's going to be an incredible career. Like Corn Ferry Tour Player of the Year, I think in what like 2019, I think it was. PJ Tour Rookie of the Year. He's gonna win player of the year this year, whether or not he even wins the tour championship. He won his second major. Actually, I think he already won player of the year in 2022. So, like, th this is the he is the most decorated golfer since Tiger Woods. And this is again in two and a half years he's done this. It took Tiger five years to get mm -hmm. to where he really hit the hit, hit hit the prominence peak. It was in '96 when he came in. His insane season, where we're at what like nine or not nine or eleven wins, happened in 2000, 2001. The Tiger Slam was in two thousand. I, I like I get it. Like Scotty isn't at the level of of the Scotty Slam yet. It's not going to happen, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um. But realistically, right? If it wasn't for if it wasn't if it, if it wasn't for the, for the Louisville Police Department, there is somewhere in the world that you could have manifested that that Scotty could 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 have won three majors this year. No one no one was beating Bryson two weeks ago. Um, we'll see what happens with the Open. I don't know if Scotty is fit for a course like Troon, but he could very well get to that slam within the five years that Tiger did. Granted, Tiger did it all in one, but Scotty's doing it a little bit more progressively. Um, at a faster clip, Does that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it, it's I, uh, nuts. I do have the privilege of hitting this button, though, Steve. Oh shit! Here you go. Hit me with it. So this comes from friend of the program, Monday Q Info. Nick Benz, I believe, is how his name is pronounced. Pardon if it's not. Uh, has never played a PGA Tour sanctioned event. He has never played an event bigger than a state open. He pounded three beers before the playoff. He just qualified for the Rocket Mortgage. Follow-up, quote tweeted by the one and only Kevin Kisner. Pair him with me at PGA Tour. <laughs> I, do you follow the uh, the popular Instagram account, uh, Willie Goat? Uh, I don't believe I do. He's just, just he's just a dude who like talks about, about like funny stuff. The way he says, oh, this fucks. It's just the funniest thing ever. This guy fucks. Yes. Nick Benz. Absolutely amazing. Well, where, where does this guy where does this kid go to college? I, I'm dying to know. Or like like where did he graduate from? Nick Benz. B-I-E-N-Z. Oh my god, he, he went to I U P U I. That's like the funniest college of all time because you because I never know what it is and I always relate it to ICUP. <laughs> oh my god! All right, so 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 this kid is going to make his PGA Tour date or his professional golf technically debut at the Rocket Mortgage. That's fucking ridiculous. Um, speaking of which, I haven't actually checked in on what's going on with Ben. He's currently in Massachusetts for the Western Mass Open. And played really early today. Shot a three under sixty eight. Don't know how the proceedings are going right now, but he said he's stuck here for the next six hours, waiting for a playoff. And lo and behold, there there is in fact a three way playoff happening right now, probably between Ben and these two other guys, Jason Thresher and Christopher Tallman. I'm kind of upset that, that we can't like view this anywhere, but we'll see how Ben does. I'm trying to see like, yeah, th th there's like no like streaming or or anything. All right, well, the worst. We'll, we'll, we'll get some uh, some breaking news out of Ben on the uh, on the other side at some juncture. But with that being said, welcome in and hello. To the get in the whole podcast, Steve McAvoy, Kyle Bennett stepping in for the Ben Piro today on the show, coming to you live from the underground part of the Underground Sports Philadelphia Podcast Network on your favorite network, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you can get a hold of our beautiful voices and our gorgeous faces. Bring you all the news, analysis, and betting tips from across the golfing world, including the PGA, LPGA, Corn Ferry, and Live Golf Tours. 
Shout out to Tyrrell Hatton and John Rom, or so, sorry, Tier All Hatton. Uh, proudly presented by some of the best, best sponsors in the biz, including our guys at Tomahawk Shades, the best small batch eyewear brand in the industry, founded on Long Island and run by some of the biggest personalities in sports, including Chris Hogan, Kyle Harrison, John Jay, and Paige Baranek. Tomahawk Shades guaranteed to keep you looking fresh from the first hole to the 18th green and beyond. Head to TomahawkShades.com or download the Tomahawk Shades app on the App Store or Google Play Store and browse their selection of no, sunglasses, blue light plus glasses, and prescription lenses. Be sure to use code USP for 25% off your next order. Again, code USP for 25% off your next order at TomahawkShades.com or the Tomahawk Shades app. Which they just had a pretty cool thing happen, Steve. Uh, I they? believe it was either Ryan or Andrew, their brothers, the founders of Tomahawk Shades. Um, obviously, John Jay, one of the owners of the company now, and he is the Miami Marlins' first base coach got some tomahawk shades into the possession of one jazz chisholm and on the most recent set of tops baseball cards jazz chisholm is wearing tomahawk shades in his baseball card you know i i appreciate that and and i'm not going to 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 give any discrediting to our sponsors because they're all great but like is it just me and as a as a national league east fan like you and i both isn't jazz chisholm the most overrated baseball player on earth I think I've I think never got seen a, somebody underwhelm me in a in a sporting event as much as as much as this man. I think he just got a raw deal because he ended up on the cover of MLB the show and so people young. people kind of were just like, Oh, he's a you know, front of a video game, you know, cover athlete now. Like he's gotta be really good. And then when Jazz has been bounced around positionally wise like he's a second baseman by trade and they're playing him in yeah. center field it's it's kind of you know one of those things where he's not he's playing out of position he's not on a good team and i think if the marlins are smart they'll trade him this trade deadline to a team that's a contender and we could see jazz chisholm like turn his career around because of it but but like even then though like jazz hasn't been healthy he's only ever his best batting average in a season was two years ago about a 254 he doesn't steal a lot of bags. The most, the most he's uh, the most he's taken uh, in a season is twenty three. He doesn't bat for a high average. He doesn't hit. He, he doesn't hit, hit the ball a country mile. Like he's he also a good plays player in a and shitty ballpark, and he's never healthy. But like, yeah, of course, it's 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 the Marlins. Like that's understandable. By the way, I didn't even realize this. The Mets are only a game and a half out of the wild card now. Yep, they're what like eight eight and two in the uh, the, the Grimace era. National League Baseball right now is an absolute clusterfuck. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous, bro. But you, 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 what's even more of a overall mess is just what's happening um, in the PGA Tour. But let's get right into it. As, of course, we're recording here on a Monday, 624, episode 160 of the Get the Little Podcast, here every Monday in the underground. Once again, I'm your host, Stephen McAvoy. That's Kyle Bennett. You can find him on Twitter. K Bizzle 311 K B I Z Z L. And of course, I'm me. I'm gorgeous. I'm amazing. Real Steve McAvoy. You know where to find me. Let's get right into, into what's happening with the fact that Scotty Scheffler can, can seem to beat everybody. And he manages to take my outright slips, tear them apart, set them on fire, and tell me to go fuck myself every single week. Uh, I live bet I live bet Tom Kim after, after round two. I also had slips on Xander Shoffley. I had a slip on Ashley Batia, and what happens? Tony Scheffler just mows right in and, uh, and says, screw you, buddy. I'm taking this over. I had I had a lot of hope that on, on 72, I'm not sure if you watched the event or if you heard anything about it. Obviously, you're on social with us, so like you know what's going on. But um, 72nd hole rolls around. I'm watching the TV, and it cuts to the um, to the cast, and it's like, it cuts away from the, the course after the approach shot. And like Scotty's walking up and it immediately goes back to the commentary. And they're, they're like, uh, yeah, there appears to be protesters on the 72nd green. We're going to take a couple minutes and we're going to uh, go to break and we'll come back to you once we get things sorted out. And I'm like, 72nd hole. Tom Kim hit, hit it like 20 feet. Scotty hit it like 10. If they both. If they both make out this tide, I think what Scotty was down one. If Tom Kim nails this putt, but Scotty makes it. If Tom wins. If Tom makes par, Scotty Scotty nails the birdie putt. We go to the playoff. I was really hoping that the protesters were going to get into 
Scotty Psyche. Also really hope, because for some apparent reason, I don't, don't, don't know why I had a dream the following night, that Tom Kim hired the protesters to run out on the course specifically to try and get in Scotty's head. The police are there. They're all around. Scotty's like, oh, no, the police. What's going on? This is this is literally what happens in my head. I wake up, I wake up at like four in the morning. He's like, "What's wrong with you?" I'm like, "I still had a dream that Scotty was so scared of the police that he stopped everything he was doing. He like had like a meltdown and he missed the putt and he bogeyed the hole." My my favorite meme was uh, shout out to Little Sasquatch uh, from Barstool. <laughs> His his viral video from a couple years ago when he was doing a skit where he pretended he got drafted in the NFL draft, mm -hmm. and it's him with like the beer in his hand and just like pointing at himself. I'm sure you yeah. know the, the yeah. you know, somebody said <laughs> Scotty Scheffler when he's teeing up a putt and he sees police running onto the course. Like, bro, really? <laughs> like it, that's like so so Kay was telling me um I don't know if you listened to uh to Dirty Heads at all the band yes I've seen them live actually I'm going to see them live all right this is a total sidebar in a week long span Jones Beach is going to have Third Eye Blind and Yellow Card 2 days later they're going to have Slightly Stupid and Dirty Heads the night after they're going to have Counting Crows and Santana and I honestly might just consider sleeping out on a beach for four straight days and just walking to Jones Fuck Beach yeah. to watch shows every single time. And they're all forty dollars a concert. Oh my I'm like, god! I'm like, That's oh my so god! Deep. Give me a give me a couple of thirty racks of Kenwood and just, just look, like, go Facts. camp out. I will be trashed for four straight days, dude. That's all those awesome shows. lineups. Um, I, I'm actually debating doing it, and I might vlog it and might like go live on Instagram for the whole four days. I've seen anyway. Yellow Card. I saw Yellow Card like on their farewell tour. One of the best concerts I've been to. I saw some forty one and Simple Plan on theirs. Also lit. jealous. But anyway, so Dirty Heads. Um, their one song that's all I need. It opens up with like a quick riff of a, of like a police siren, mm -hmm. and it's summer. I roll the windows down. I I jam out to my uh my playlists, and that song always manages to come on. And Kay hates it when songs have police sirens in them because she gets like nervous, particularly when she's driving. So the other day she's driving and I put the song on and it, and like it comes in and it's like wow 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 who's there? I'm like okay, it's it, it's the song. She's like, oh, I fucking hate that. I said, like, oh yeah, I know. That's why I played it. Like, so does on. she? Does she hate Bobby Valentino? Yes. Like she she hates so many things about the police siren in music. She's never been pulled over. Isn't like, it never, insane never... that Bobby Valentino's? claim to fame is that he imitated a police siren in Mrs. Officer by Lil Wayne. <laughs> so horrible. <laughs> also, what that and Fireman are probably two of the best songs on the Carter 2. Fireman coming. The Carter 2 is so good. Carter 2 is incredibly underrated. But by the way, and no free ads, um, you'll you'll love this. Uh, again, we'll we'll talk we'll talk Scotty in a minute. I'm on this app with all my friends from back home. It's called Music League, and basically it's like like you create um, you create prompts, and like everyone picks a song that's related to the prompt, and then everyone votes on it. So like one of the one of the, the one of the topics was like like best song from Lil Wayne's career, and like mm -hmm. everyone's throwing out absolutely. Like, bangers and like there's some songs that like i forgot even existed that i'm like oh my god like will wayne like wrote this i don't know if you remember um there's a song with birdman yeah i got i got i gotta look it up uh there's two songs with birdman Ling -ling? That, no 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 no. hold on I, I, I i'm gonna player. i'm determined to find this one of them was a one of them was a single that I believe ended up on a Little Wayne track. So one of them, so Fire Flame was one of them, oh, and then bad. Dark Shades with Mac Mahon and Lil Wayne. Yep, two heat songs. Dude, I am a Lil Wayne stan, and there's a clip on our socials of myself and Dom. Shout out to Dom; he's on his honeymoon in Italy right now. Oh, nice. Um, we both agree that Lil Wayne's the greatest rapper ever. I, I I disagree, but he's certainly in that like conversation. 
the the, the problem is is like you, you got to look at the eras of rap and like figure out like what really is truly the best because we like, eliminated Biggie and Tupac because their careers were cut short. So we didn't get to see if, them all the way through. If I'm going to eliminate the two of them, honestly, my top choice would probably be hmm. lyrically Nas. Nas is definitely up there. Artistically, a tribe called Quest. They're great. And like but think about Lil Wayne and all of the artists that he's Jay-Z influenced. Tab, but like, like Lil Wayne's got the it, if you look at my core of growing up in rap, which was like my formidable years between like fifth grade and like eighth grade, circa 2009 to like 2012. The heart of rap in that generation was it was Drake, it was Lil Wayne, and like Kendrick wasn't even up at that point yet. Um, like Wiz Khalifa was like a big part of my my, my like growing up. So and like who put who put Drake onto the scene? It's Lil, Lil Wayne. Wayne. YMCMB. All for Kendrick to just wop 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 wop. <laughs> that man that man bought together Bloods, Crips, and the, and the whole nine, and, and then sang not like us six times in a row. There's no man on earth who eats Drake more than Kendrick Lamar. And, I, and the best part is too, and I was saying saying this the other day, other day to my coworkers. I'm like, the '90s were great because when rappers said they'd kill you, they would actually do it. The only person who has the balls to kill anybody is Kendrick Lamar. But he's like, I don't even have to shoot you in the face; I'll just do it lyrically. You're yes. done. And that's on the floor. The beauty about it, and I was yeah. dying laughing because the one clip from his live performance that was on Amazon, uh, the camera angles that were cutting when he just did the wah 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 wah. Someone quote tweeted and said, "This motherfucker got the cameraman out here cutting like it's an episode of an anime." Amazing. <laughs> Guy absolutely stun- stunned. Oh. Speaking, of, speaking of stun, so Scotty Scheffler, let's get into the news, uh, breaks out four straight rounds of four under par or better. Or sorry, sorry, three under par or better. Um, he's only one of four golfers to, to be able to do that during the week. Um, let me actually make sure that my numbers here are correct, right? Pretty sure I am. Did I have a total? No, here, here you go. Yeah, he's the only player to shoot five under or better in all four rounds. He's only one of four players including Sanjay M, Tom Kim, and Tony Fina to, to, uh, to play four straight rounds and three under or better. He was simply just the best player on the course for the week, and, and it wasn't even that he was dominating with a Cameron Young 60, 59 or a Seb Straka 61 or a Tom Hoagie 62. He just played consistent golf all the way through. And, I felt like and our everyone friends- was getting like those score updates this weekend too. With like, oh, this person's super low. Like it felt like it was yeah. like one after the other. It was like, holy shit! Like everyone's well, like, having that's, a weekend. That that's really that's really just the beauty of the Travelers. It's a while it is a great golf course. Don't get me wrong. I love the Travelers. I've been there. I've played it. I think it's a beautiful golf course. the The Travelers is a short golf course that has been overtaken by the ability to hit the ball long and far. Like it's a golf course that is it's out of its time. It's it was great in the 90s, it was great in the 2000s, it's great in the 80s. It's no longer a signature golf course that is that should be on the PGA Tour, although I agree it should still be on. They can't grow it out any further. They can't extend tee boxes any further than than, than it is. They're built essentially right off of a reserve. There's water everywhere, so you're kind of strapped in. And then you have houses that meander all, all around the golf course. So it's tough. And when you're a guy like Scotty Scheffler who hits the ball a country mile and can drive four of the 18 greens uh, on par fours, it kind of gets a little bit challenging when when you can constantly make par, but only two eagles is, is all you need in order to have a, have, a, have, a, have a really good day. He paced the field in, every, um, in almost every statistical category um, in terms of event averages, he was top ten in putting, top ten, top ten in approach uh, around the green, off off the tee, tee to green. Uh, in terms of strokes gain total, like the, the the leaderboard speaks for itself. It was literally in perfect array um, that the strokes gain total numbers. And you don't you don't normally see this. Literally went Scotty, Tom Kim, Hoagie, uh, Sanjay M, Batia, Cantlay, and the rest. So like it literally evened out perfect but Scotty Scheffler was just the one guy who was able to avoid bogeys and shoot a consistent deep under par round all the way through 
Now, does that take away from anybody else in the field? No. But I do think that this was the this might have been the easiest win of Scotty Scheffler's career to date. Which might call it a hot take because he had yeah, it's the signature event and there's a loaded field, but um he's just simply too good for the golf course, and there's a reason why his 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 plus money number was just so low. Then you have someone on the flip side like Cameron Young, who despite shooting at 59, still finishes outside of the top 10, um, which is like kind of crazy. Uh, going into that round, he said that he was not feeling it very good. He had duffed like three shots going like immediately before the round. And I was like, oh God, like I'm, I'm not doing well. He only hit six fairways, which is the lowest number of fairways that any player who has ever recorded a 60 or lower has ever hit in, a, in, a, in an event. That's wild. Yeah. It like when we, cause I, have like our Twitter account on my phone too, just in yeah. case you guys are out or whatever. And I was getting the updates from nuclear golf shout out, no free shout outs. And it was just like, everything was like coming up cam young for like two and a half days straight. And I was like, Oh shit. Like he's going to come out and, and win this thing. And Nope. Scotty's just inevitable. And Dave Portnoy keeps winning bets on Scotty Scheffler and racking in hundreds of thousands of dollars on Scotty Scheffler. And I mean, at, the, at this point, Steve, like the rest of the season, is, is it almost fair to say that like it's it's a better bet to just take Scotty Scheffler to win as well, long as he's in the field? I mean, if I had the kind of money that Portnoy had, I mean, it'd be, it'd be, yeah, it'd be a home sure. run. I'm just saying um, just in general, like if you're looking at an event, Scotty Scheffler's in it, you know, how everyone does the hypotheticals. Am I taking this person to the field? 90% of the time you're taking the field. It feels like the way that this year has gone for Scotty, it's just like he is going to find a way no matter where it is, what the situation is, he's going to find a way to win. Well, so, so let's talk about it, right? Like he has six wins this year. He's won the Masters, he won the Players, and then his other four wins all came at signature events. Does that mean that with the exception of Augusta National, where he's already won in the past, and the players, where, again, he had won in the past, like, it feels like he wins the same events. And it's it's Good technically point. true. He has two wins at the players, two wins at the Masters, two wins at the Waste Management, two wins at the Arnold Palmer. And like the, only, the only difference in his career accolades is that he won the match play, which no longer exists, and he won the RBC Heritage and uh, and the Travelers, and then the Memorial. Like he's yes, granted they're all different, they're all challenging golf courses in, in their own specific way. But the RBC Heritage is a very simple golf course comparatively to everything else. Yeah, it's a pinpoint course, but it isn't the hardest Pete Dye course on, on earth. Um, the Travelers again, not a challenging golf course, and he won it in a playoff. Might I add, like the like the Memorial is the most is the most impressive win of the year amongst those those events that he had not had, had never won in the past so when you put it that way i'm curious to actually see what happens the rest of the way through now that, that, that now that the signature event schedule is done the only or there's only one major left he probably won't play a ton um leading up to it but i just think it's very interesting how we're at this this level that he is kind of in a league of its own, and is it worth it to bet him when he's in the field every week? I think you might actually have better value if you're a good handicapper of the sport and you follow good people. For example, like Matt Vincenzi has been on, on an absolute tear. He has, he's had, I think, three winners in the last four weeks. Um, but like if you pick a lot of these guys, like top fives, mm -hmm. like for example, this week, and I'm going to totally just give it away because it's because like, it's might be the easiest bet, that, bet that, I, that I make all year. Um, I'm going to take Min Woo Lee this week for a top five at the Rocket Mortgage to get him at plus 450 comparatively to what I can get Scotty Scheffler at like plus 300. Like you at least have some buffer to work with. And yeah, a top five is very challenging to hit. But if you're top of the field and, and can still place in that, in that position, even like Tom Kim, like I took Tom Kim to win this past week. If, if, if you, if, the handicappers pick someone to win that has low odds or, or sorry, really high odds. And you could possibly get them for a top five at a good number 
in the 600s, then take it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's like, I think it's fine if you want to, like, if you, if you have the disposable income to just bet on Charlie Scheffler, it's the same as like the guys who, who handicap March Madness by picking the underdog and burning a hundred dollars. You might be down $1,200 after the first weekend, but at some point your St. Peter's is going to be Kentucky. And all of a sudden you're going to make $2,200 and now you're plus 700 at that point. So like, is it worth it? I don't really know, but yeah, if you have, if you have Portnoy money, it's that the, there's no easier bet and sweat in, in, in sports than to just take Scotty Scheffler. Yeah. I mean, he's been on fire and you know, when, <clears throat> when you, when you put it in the sense of he wins the same events, it, it would be fun to watch him compete in an event that he hasn't won before and see how he performs. Like I, I want to see him this playoff go around with that, with the season that he's having. Which, by the way, I, I'm I need to look into something quick. Um, w- with the way that he has been playing this year, I want to see what Scotty Scheffler can do from the playoffs. Because mm-hmm. his let's let's take a little little deep dive, right? So Scotty Scheffler's results in his career at playoff events are as follows. Last year he finished. So last year he finished uh 31st at the FedEx St. Jude, second at the BMW, and he finished sixth at East Lake with the aggregate scoring that's involved. I think the the gross, he was like somewhere in the, somewhere in the top three. The year prior to that, he finished. He missed the cut at the FedEx St. Jude. Finished third at the BMW and finished second at East Lake. So like, he's and I'm not, I'm not gonna say that like finishing third at a playoff event is not impressive in the slightest. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2020, he finished 43rd at the at the Northern Trust, which is then got taken over by this by the FedEx St. Jude, but finished 14th there. Um, 22nd at the BMW and the 22nd at East Lake. I'm not going to say that, that that finishing top five in each of the final two events of the year is not impressive, particularly when you go to East Lake and you can finish top five. Um, right. Incredibly impressive, but he can't finish there. So I'm actually curious to see if he can finish there and finally win the FedEx Cup and see what he can do um, in that sense. By the way, now, as of... Well, actually, this hasn't even updated yet. That's unfortunate. Um, the, the data golf all time ranking still has Scotty Scheffler listed at the memorial for his last event. Pro- that number is probably going to jump by, by about 0. 0.1, 0. 0.2. Um, but he's only 0. 0.6 then off of Tiger Woods' all time greatest season. Uh, just kind of give you a, a frame of reference for how, for how great he's been this year. Uh, turning over with the signature events now being over, I want to look back at the, the winners and the losers of, of, of the, the signature event schedule. Technically, the first ever year we've had signature events. We had the elevated events last year that were kind of just like a concept, um, but they they officially became what they are now um, per Jay Monahan as of this year. Uh, I want to dig into some winners and losers with you. I've talked to Ben about it, but I like to get the outsider's perspective on this as well when it comes to where the signature events did well and where they kind of fell off. Um the first winner is quite quite obvious. It's Scotty Scheffler. Uh, <laughs> he's made seventeen million dollars in winnings and has won. He won half of the signature events. Now that, that now that isn't including the players and it isn't it's not including the majors. If you do include them, he still won half of them so far. He's won six of ten, with sorry six of eleven with with one more to go, and he very well could win the open. So Ooh, the, the wind is howling right now. Um. But the the, the 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 three big losers that I noticed, and I'll rattle them off and then get, then get your opinion. Uh, I think that the losers of the signature schedule for the year has been a the placement of events, b the events that were selected, and c the competition factor. So you've obviously been following along with us um, and figuring this out, but. Signature events yield limited field of 70 players, top 70 players, 
the Aeon uh, Swing Five, which is like like the five best players um, on the outside looking in, like get, like get exemption into the events, and then previous win- and then pr- winners throughout the year. Scheduling, they have kind of ch- ch- chopped the pooch a couple times. With the U.S. Open, they had a signature event this week and the week prior to the U.S. Open. They had a signature event the week after the PGA Championship. They had a signature event at the beginning of the year at the Century, which really is a not really a, even a signature event to begin with. It's just a it's just the former champions of, of the year plus some that get to play. Uh, and then then I believe they had three in three in five weeks leading up to the Masters and the players with Bay Hill somewhere lobbed in between. Uh, and then finally, with that, I think if there's some of the events that, that that have been chosen as signature events, one of which I pointed out recently was the RBC Heritage. Um, the other RBC event on the calendar every year is the Canadian Open. I think a national open is more important than the Heritage, despite cool you get to go to Harbor Links every year. Mm-hmm. Um, the Wells Fargo is losing their sponsorship now; they're they're not renewing. So don't know who's going to be taking over at Quail Hollow, but is that going to maintain its signature event status? And I don't think that the century needs a signature event. What is your opinion on my points, at least, and where the PGA Tour can do better when it comes to having these signature events, not stacking them up with majors, over burning out players, uh, and then also just the competition factor, limiting these fields and kind of just being what live golf is? I I agree wholeheartedly with everything you've said about like the stacking them with majors. I think that's their biggest flop is making these pretty much as close to requirable events. They are, you know, literally you you get like one exemption. I think we were talking. So, you know, however many there are, I'm blank. So, you know, seven out of eight are must play along with the majors that, in terms of ego and just what they are, you're playing in those as well. To stack events like that, I feel like is diminishing the the schedule to what could be a, a year-long type of just like get your popcorn ready, sit down, you know like the big dogs are playing in this event. And then you're not killing your major, or if it's after a major, you're not killing a signature event exactly. that could build up to be something awesome. And if you spread them out more throughout the calendar to where you know the stackability kind of loses its uh, ability to diminish what you're you're getting right now, I think it's an easy fix across the board and it's just tinkering with the schedule to make sure that you're not diminishing your product because as much as we've seen guys play extremely well just think about what these guys could do in a major or in a signature event if they weren't stacked up exactly and you look at it from the perspective of like where where are they placed throughout the calendar first of all the, the century forever was the it was literally called forever the century tournament of champions it was all the past winners the guys who finished top 30 on the tour championship list, plus other specific exemptions towards like top core and very tour players, whatever it is, and that, that all changed this year. That th- then then it became a little more expanded, but it's still it, it's a you're first of all, you're playing at, at a resort golf course in the middle of Hawaii. Guys play to play that event because it's a getaway for their families, and it's the first event of, of the year in January, more than anything else. So why does that have um, the tag on it. The first four events of the year, if you don't count the century, it goes the century, three non-important events, which really one of them actually is, is incredibly important. The Farmers Insurance Open at Torrey Pines is one of the hardest events of the year. Um, that was also the event, if you remember, that had the leaderboard of Matthew Pavan won, and then basically the board was just like, who the fuck is this? And that was when the, when the debate sparked of, oh, is the PG Tour getting worse because they because because of, of live guys? Week prior to that was the Amex when Nick Dunlap won and then won and then turned pro again. A challenging golf course in California could have very well taken away the century and put and put one there. Um, the Pebble Beach Pro Am got its first signature event status this year solely on the back of the fact that no one wants to go play it because it's full of 
celebrities and rounds are six hours long and the weather sucks ass in Western California um, out in Pebble Beach at that time of the year in early Fe- in early February. The Waste Management had a, had an elevated event status last year, probably should get the event next year. Um, but the problem is that back-to-back, you have the Waste Management and then it's the Genesis. So it's two top-tier events within a two-week span. Um, is it okay to have, let's say, the Farmers Insurance open and then the Waste Management, and then maybe every year you teeter back and forth the Waste Management and Genesis back and forth? That's totally fine. Genesis will probably always get it, though, because that, that's like Tiger's event. So it makes sense why why your three signature events that always need to be signature is Tiger's event, Arnie's event, and Jack's event. It's always going to be what it is. The Memorial, Bay Hill, and the Genesis all need to be signature for that specific reason. Waste management already gets to get a ton, ton of views and a lot of hits, so it could necessarily it could not get it. But to win there, it's a big event for 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 some people to win. Um, I would say the farmers deserve a spot over the century. You look down the hardest part of the tour schedule, and Ben agrees with me when we say this: going to play PGA National in Palm Beach uh, for what's now what is now the Cognizant, formerly the Honda, one of the hardest events in golf to win, has never been considered a signature event. But it's right behind the Arnold Palmer Invitational, so you really can't have it there. Then, um, then the week after Arnie signature event is the Players, a, a quasi signature event. Week after that is the Valspar, also a very challenging event. Could be a a signature event, but shouldn't get it because it's after the Players. Um, then you wait two weeks. Then it's the Masters. Immediately after the Masters, they have the RBC Heritage. Why is it a signature event? Then you have two two weeks off. Then it's the Wells Fargo. Then immediately after the Wells Fargo is the PGA Championship. Then after that, it's Charles Schwab at Colonial, a big time event that's been around forever, but you really can't give it the status because it's it's right after the PGA. Then it's the RBC Canadian Open, which the Heritage should really give to the Canadian Open. All right, that solves one issue there. But you have the Canadian Open signature event. Let's just say, then the memor- then it's the Memorial signature event, and the U.S. Open, then the Travelers. Like the schedule does not make any fucking sense to be able to give fans a good enough experience where now we're going to go into the Rocket Mortgage, the John Deere, the Scottish Open, three straight weeks of non-signature golf right into the Open, and then we're going to play, granted with the Olympics, it gets a little bit different, but what would be considered three straight weeks of non-signature golf then, then into the playoffs. There should have been an event somewhere within those two clips mm-hmm. that should have been given a signature status or you move the schedule around you have you play it you play an event two weeks later they should play pebble beach at some point now in the year mm-hmm. when it's gorgeous outside california not when it's rainy and Wyndham clark can shoot a course record 60 and win a mickey mouse title in three rounds that isn't correct so i think like i, I keep on beating the beating the dead horse here but like why must it be so hard why do events have to be the same week every single year? Like F1's got it right. They managed mm-hmm. to separate their schedule well enough where, when you know, all right, we're going to Monaco this week. We're going to Monza this week. You know what's happening throughout the schedule. And you know that you have a couple of off events in between. I mean, the PLL is doing it this year from my experience. You know, like this is the first year that teams have uh, a hometown affiliation. So, that weekend, if that team is in their home market, they're playing a double header. But yeah. then they also have this upcoming week. They're in Minnesota, which does not have a homecoming team, and in Connecticut, which I think you and I are going to be tackling that just mm-hmm. as a duo. Um, there's no home market team there, so each team is just playing one game. But everyone knows that they've done a fantastic job over the years too with it being a touring model. That you know, hey, this weekend is going to be in Baltimore the past couple of years. That's Hall of Fame weekend. So, you know, like yeah. people are going to turn out for that in a Mecca of lacrosse, this, that, and the third. Everyone knows for the playoff schedule, Philadelphia is where the championship is. So you can plan accordingly. All right, we're going to Philly for the championship. It, it's it's really simple to make your schedule cater to your audience. And it just feels like the PGA Tour does this constantly no matter what it is they make things harder than they have to be and it drives people insane but also you can rotate around in certain regards i feel like so every single week the week of my birthday is the waste management without fail that's the week 
also happens to be the same week as the Super Bowl. Why are you scheduling one of your biggest events the same weekend as the Super Bowl? Does not make sense. Why is it that when you go play, I think it's the American Express or it's the Farmers or it's the farm or it's the Farmers, it's on the same weekend as a major playoff weekend in the NFL. So you're going to cater the, to the NFL because you can't show your games on a Sunday. So you'll play Wednesday through Saturday, final round Saturday. Why can't we place a lower scale event that week? I get it. There's a there's a geographic piece to this. There's you go to Hawaii, then you go to California, then you go to Florida, then you go to Texas. But now, like where we're at now on the schedule, it there there isn't really a rhyme or reason in terms of why we go to the places that we do go. And there are new events coming into the fold every single year, and um, sponsors moving out and out and so on and so forth. You look at at the way it, the way it's scheduled first. First uh, two weeks are in Hawaii. Next three weeks are in California. Then you go to Arizona, back to Cal- back to California. Then you go to Florida for four and a half straight weeks. Then you go to Texas for two weeks. Then it's the Masters that down in Georgia, so you're going relatively close. But then it's South Carolina to Louisiana to Texas to North Carolina to wherever wherever the PGA is, back to Texas to Canada to Ohio, relatively close, fine. To wherever the U.S. Open is, to Connecticut, now to Michigan, then to Illinois, th- then you're th- th- then you're going from from Detroit to the middle of nowhere in Illinois. Then you go overseas. When you come back from overseas, you go to uh, to Minnesota, and then you go to North Carolina, and then all of a sudden it's the playoffs where you go from in this case Tennessee to Colorado to, to Georgia. Can't we just like mix up the schedule a little bit? Do we need to go to California for three straight weeks? Can we go for two weeks, then go to Arizona, then go to California back? Can we have the waste management happen at the end of February? Can we have, I mean, like you're never going to move the scheduling of the majors. That's fine. But can we make the travelers happen a month earlier, maybe when it's not 95 degrees in the Northeast, Mm -hmm. have it on a breezy day where conditions are going to be challenging at a golf course. It's not very hard anymore. I think there's a lot of ups and there's a lot of upsides to changing around things, but everyone knows the weekend of the 23rd is always going to be the travelers. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows Memorial Day weekend is the Memorial Tournament. Everyone knows that the around St. Patrick's Day, whatever that weekend is going to be, is Bay Hill. And everyone knows the first week of April is the Masters. Okay, there are some things that we can keep, but you have to be able to, to move things around and make it more affordable. Or you know what? Cut your losses and make and make less events mm-hmm. and turn some events into secondary events and let guys earn FedEx Cup points and try and get PGA-sanctioned events more often because that's what's going to help raise the caliber of golf and get more people interested. Nope. And now, for example, right, Harry Higgs just, just just earned back his earned back his PGA Tour card, but he's not going to be on course every single week. He's going to play some of these lesser scale events. He's not going to get into signature events. He's going to fight his ass off now from the fall to try and even try and qualify for it. Like that's the problem that the PGA Tour suffers with. Mm-hmm. Everyone else is adaptable; they're simply not. We're going to take a short break. On the other side, we're going to go over. The Rocket Mortgage Classic. You know, the last time that we did a preview of the Rocket Mortgage, someone won a golf event. I think you know exactly who it is, and it's really ironic that you and I get to cover it once again for another year. Can Ricky Fowler defend his title? Ricky at, boys! At the Rocket Mortgage. We'll be right back. KB and steve here in the underground. Don't go anywhere, folks. Get in the Hole is brought to you by PHI Apparel Company, our incredible merch partners. PHI Apparel Co. provides unique designs and high-quality clothing from t-shirts to hoodies for every golfer around. With their original designs for all, there's no doubt you'll stand out on the course, the driving range, or at the 19th hole. Go to phiapparel.co and use code UNDERGROUND at checkout for 10% off any order. That's code 
underground at phiapparel.co and grab exclusive Get in the Hole podcast merch and support your favorite golfers. Welcome, welcome, welcome back into Get in the Hole. KB Steve over here on a Monday, the 24th, episode 160 of the Get in the Hole podcast, breaking down our introduction to another great Detroit Rocket Mortgage class. But before we get to that, KB, we got some very fun news out of the underground camp. A lot of new things developing. I'll talk about that. Yeah, this uh, portion of the show is brought to you by ourselves. Um, <laughs> so, DJ, it's funny that you know we're going to Detroit. DJ in Michigan. We were uh, we were talking on the most recent episode of the Outside the Box podcast and just riffing about stuff. And it was like, should we do an Olympics podcast? So I sent in our group chat the boys. I was talking to Casey and Owen. Send it to everybody that works for our company. I said, you know, this would be a very fun way for us to spike the podcast charts, get us out there in a different, you know, forum and allow us to kind of just riff and hang out and do content with people who work for our company that we traditionally don't get to do content with every week and talk about sports that every four years we enjoy watching sitting down and being like holy shit this is so much fun and they're traditionally just not available to us um so yeah we are going to be kicking off olympics coverage at underground sports philadelphia with a brand new podcast and a brand new forum we're de- we're figuring out if we want to do the video version of it as a live stream or just a recorded uh session after you know certain days of the 2024 Summer Olympics in France, but uh, we are introducing Light the Flame, an Olympics podcast where all your favorite underground sports Philadelphia personalities will come together to discuss, banter, and break down the Olympic Games. It's coming soon, and it is now available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, but it will be on other platforms in the near future, and it will be on the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel as well for videos live streams and clips uh throughout the 2024 olympics and beyond because we don't want to just stop after one olympics what's the fun with that you know we were talking you know podcast platforms allow you to do like seasons of shows so like this year will be season one and then the 2026 winter olympics will be season two and then hopefully me you and dj are out in la for 2028 to cover golf and lacrosse in person that'll be season three and just beyond it's a fun way to uh just cover sports that we traditionally don't get to do. And like the summer Olympics are so much fun. And the sports that are now in the summer Olympics are just a a blast to watch. And a bunch of them are things we cover, whether it's, you know, basketball with Joel Embiid playing for team USA golf is in it. Soccer is in it. We have a bunch of swimming aficionados that work for this company and former swimmers that work for this company. So there's a whole lot that we're going to be able to do. And I'm looking forward to this project a ton. It, it also helps that that we have um, the fastest man in the world just flashing Yu-Gi-Oh cards uh, yes. on, <laughs> well, like like because a fucking nerd and he runs a he runs the hundred meter in seven seconds. Beast. Like what? Like what the hell? I don't, what card is that? Anyways, I don't even it's know. The head of Exodia. <laughs> just wait crying. until he activates a trap card at the finish line. Just and wait. Just, uh, and everyone, Everyone falls into the Starlight uh, pit. I, I'm just, I, I literally just messed Star Wars and Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh, God. Charizard's going to come out. He's gonna, this guy's going to pull a Pokeball like, like, like out of his pocket. Cue the Pokemon time. theme song. Let it rip. I saw I saw something about, about, about Noah Lyles finishing the 100 meter, like Naruto sprinting. <laughs> can, can he beat everybody just, just doing that? Yeah, I, I love the Olympics. Um, I, I am the world's biggest track and field enthusiast when the when when the olympics rolls around my friend mike who actually ran um d3 sprints over at muhlenberg college out in allentown uh he he's, he's actually very interested in joining us and talking sprints specifically um after all that was his craft that's what he knows best uh and me and him get together every summer um every four years in the summer to literally watch sprints all night long and it's so fun we get food we hang out we do our thing um, the fact that golf's involved, despite the fact that I don't like the, like, like the organization and the, and the setup of golf, is great for great for the sport. 
um, to be able to to partake in like like swimming is a great example. Like I don't get to watch swimming and diving on the daily, and it, and it's like the one time it's available on like ESPN Plus, but, but from like one random ass college, like Prairie View A and M is doing a a diving competition. Like that that's that's fun. It's great to watch. It's a good time. Like water polo, incredible. Um, to be able to take in these sports is is awesome, and to be able to do that with us is is great. Hopefully, we have a lot of guests on to do a lot of different uh, chatter and a lot of. Um, live streams as well throughout the Olympic coverage, and then of course in two years we have uh, we have the World Cups. So we're probably going to end up doing a doing a, a season of that across uh, the underground. So really, about, really awesome stuff to be, be able. To speaking build. of track and field, uh, Brandon Marsh, Philly's outfielder, his sister is on Team USA for track and field. She does the heptathlon. The, what that seven events? Six Nine? or seven. Heptathlon. Yeah. What what an athletic family. Uh, the heptathlon is yeah seven events: hundred meter hurdles, high jump, shot put, two hundred meter dash, long jump, javelin, and eight hundred meter run. This what, what's her name? Uh, Aaron Marsh. Aaron or Aaron? E R I N. Aaron Marsh. Wow, th- this woman's an athlete, mm-hmm. and she is literally. I, I I can't even say she's literally Brandon Marsh with long hair because they both have long hair. Um, you can oh. tell they're siblings though. Yeah, totally. Duke Duke alumni. Yeah, nasty athlete. That's amazing. Good for her. She actually won the gold medal at in the heptathlon at the twenty twenty three Pan Am Pan Am Games. Yeah, it was really cool. Brandon Marsh like flew down to go watch her after the Philly season had ended, and Very surprised cool. her. She had no idea he was going to be there. But yeah, she's a beast. Um, working on because uh, it was supposed to happen in twenty twenty one. But the scheduling just didn't line up. But uh, Rowdy Gaines follows us on Twitter and agreed to come right. on the podcast. Uh, swimming legend. Uh, and he's now the color analyst for all the swimming broadcasts. So Rowdy Gaines may be coming on the show. Speaking of swimming, uh, I I did not know that he was trying to be an Olympian. Do you know who missed out on qualifying for the Olympics in swimming? Who? Cody Simpson. Cody Simpson. Do you remember who Cody Simpson is? Maybe if I see his face. <laughs> He's the Australian pop star turned swimmer who... Oh, I did see something He, about he has that one song that's like on the radio, radio. <laughs> yeah. Dude. I had no idea who jacked. he was. He just looked like super jacked. And I was yeah, like, damn. Bro, bro, pretty eyes Cody Simpson. Like every girl like my age at, in like middle school was like so into this man's. That's crazy. Yeah, he he missed qualification for the Olympics. I think he 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 like, I think he was specifically in the butterfly. That was my event. event. Let me see. Um, hmm. Uh, he lost the personal best fifty twenty two in the men's hundred meter freestyle, but failed to make the finals in twenty twenty one. Uh, twenty twenty three, he won his first individual medal medal in an international meet after begging. Ba- begging, bagging silver in the men's 100 meter butterfly at the Swimming World Cup in Athens. Yeah, he, all right, here, 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 here uh, attempts to qualify the men's 100 meter freestyle and his pet event, the 100 meter butterfly. He has uh, a, a personal best of 48.67. Came in fifth in the butterfly with a 51.79, just over a half a second short. A swimming Australia's Olympic qualification time of five one seventeen. That's crazy. That's wild. I yeah. saw like a picture of him floating around like Twitter and everything at the trials and everything. Also crazy that they put a pool inside Lucas Oil Stadium. That's sick. um. Well, well, th- th- I think that they said for for the twenty twenty eight Olympics they're going to put a pool inside of SoFi, mm-hmm. which is also crazy. But again. Olympic coverage going to be awesome. This guy's going to absolutely just murk everyone. What a beast. We need to get him on one of our shows. What I would do to talk to Noah Lyles would be absolutely tremendous. Hi, also, honey. also just to uh, let everyone know, the Phillies just turned to triple play, and it was really fucking cool. Wow. Wow. Congratulations. I don't care. <laughs> let's go Mets. Let's, let's hope they do something. Question of the day comes from uh, from this guy on Twitter, at Real Steve McAvoy. Can Ricky Fowler defend his title at the Rocket Mortgage Classic? 
Yeah, he actually he, he actually looked very good um at the Travelers this past week. I'm curious what you think is going to take Ricky Fowler to defend. Um, can we cue the twenty percent luck, ten percent skill, fifteen percent concentrated power? power well. Well. He finished top twenty uh, at the Travelers. Actually, had had a I think a 62, 63 to start on day one, but just couldn't get the mojo uh, flowing for him. Um, to be honest with you, I don't think he's going to fare incredibly well this week. He doesn't really fit um, with his current with his current form. Uh, then again, I could be totally wrong, considering he was completely out of form, and we bet him. Off- on a whim last year, and what happened? He won. Well, granted, he, granted, he also was T two at the U.S. Open and lost to Wyndham Clark in that playoff. So, like, he had form there. Um, I don't think it's going to be Ricky Fowler's week. That's just just the way that I see it. Not much has changed on this golf course. It's the basically exactly what we um, we've seen in the past: seventy three hundred yards, par seventy two layout, uh, extremely flat throughout. Bent grass greens. It's going to be a putter fest. Um, there's going to be a lot of really strong uh, contestants this week, of course, inclu- including Cam Young, Tom Kim will try and win, Min Ru Lee, Ashley Batia is back in the field. Last two years, we've seen scores in the mid-20 under par area. Um, when Bryson won here in 2020, he dropped 23 under. It lastly in 2019, 25 under. Um, Finau and Ricky, 26 and 24 under a piece. So we'll see how they manage to fare this week. And with that being said, let's get right into what's happening with our beer money picks presented by Kenwood Beer. Again, need to get me some 30s of Kenwood before I go and sleep on a beach and watch Santana just absolutely shrug guitar. Who is Kenny? He's smooth, he's clean, he's bright with a taste of boot. He, Whenever I say boot, I, I sound like <laughs> an idiot. Boot? Taste of boot? Kenny's the routine choice of folks who want a fl- balanced, flavorful, no frills beer that's right for any occasion. Only 120 calories and 8 grams of carbs. It is not only Cody Simpson's favorite beer, but it should also be yours. We say you can't beat the original. Head to KenwoodBeer.com. Use the Kenny Tracker to find where you can get your hands on some ice cold, refreshing Kenwood beer. Now, now available in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and now in the great state of Delaware, as well as the Wells Fargo Center and beyond. Must be 21 years or older to do so. And of course, please, please drink responsibly. And if you're in the uh, tri-state area going to take in some concerts, some live podcasts that they do, the Man Center, a phenomenal venue, uh, Tall Boy Kenny's available there all season long. Well, where the where the tri-state area? <laughs> I need more Doofenshmirtz in my the life. The Kenwood Beerinator. Inator. <laughs> the best thing ever, uh, and, and I still make this joke to this day, is the one cut scene where it's like, or too much more. It's after hours. <laughs> top twenty pick at at the Rock and Mortgage. What do you got? Top twenty. Let's take a look at the board here, because uh, we want to give you some value, but also some stuff that will obviously net you some beer money, cash. Um, beer money, cash money, bank. It's like YMCMB, but better. That's called a callback. You know what? We're we're gonna ride again, Steve. Top 20 plus 225. Shout out to the Ricky boys. Give me Ricky Fowler. Uh, I am going to give you a pick that's going to blast your socks off right next to Ricky Fowler on the odds board for, for a top 20. Um, really good form as of late. Has been playing um, surprisingly surprisingly well despite his uh, his mid-range age. I'm going to go with Matt Wallace. He finished, six, he finished 15th at the KLM Open on the DP World Tour last week. Uh, he has made five straight cuts on the PGA Tour, a fourth place finish at the Byron Nelson. Uh, here in the past, he's finished top, tw- uh, finished T12 and T10. Uh, he, had, he had a 78th place finish last year, but it's okay. 34 year olds for a top 20 at plus 240. I'll take that to the bank. Top 10. Top 10. I'm going to go with one of our all name team members, and that is Maverick McNeely at plus 320. I'm following you. I'm following you absolutely hardcore. Maverick McNeely, top 10. At plus 320. Uh, I love what Matt's been able to do so far this year. He's finished, uh, he's, he's, had, he's had the pretty good weeks uh, in the lead up. Finished 23rd of Valhalla, 17th at Colonial, 7th at the uh, Canadian Open. Um, he finished 
tied for eighth and 21st in 2020 and 2021. Did not play particularly well last year. He missed the cut. Um, but honestly, like he, he hits the ball so well. He hits a far enough. He hits it straight enough. And his approach play has been great the entirety of the year. I think a top 10 is a pretty uh, safe spot for him here. Top five. Uh, I am going to rock with Akshay Batia at plus 450. Um, I have a crazy, crazy value pick here. Uh, you want to talk about like betting Scotty Scheffler plus 300 to win every week? How about Ben Griffin at at, uh, at 11 to 1 plus 1100 to finish top five this week for Ben Griffin? Kind of fits all of the uh, the parameters here pretty much to a T. And again, um, the birdie machine, the putter, it's got to be the one that, that's on this week. So I'll ride there. Your gimme pick. My gimme pick is going to be um let's see. Can I find a good prop or something here? Let's see. Um, I'm going to rock out with Yeah, let's let's double up here. Top twenty at plus one fifty, Maverick McNeely. We're gonna double up a little bit. Uh I don't know why I can't find him on this board. Oh, here, here we go. Uh he's plus two hundred for a top thirty finish. Yeah, you could also probably get him for a top twenty at plus four hundred. Uh he does one thing really well and he hits the ball really far. Uh, in his last 24 rounds, this man ranks fifth in the field in driving distance and seventh in strokes gain off the tee. Uh, he has never played this golf course before, but I think he fits it really well. The Argentinian Alejandro Tosti. Sexy name. Great name. Great name. All name team. Your winner at the Rocket Mortgage, not named Ricky Fowler. Uh, my winner, not named Ricky Fowler, unfortunately. I am going to go with the guy you mentioned earlier, Min Woo Lee at plus 2,000. Um, and I also have something here on the old green sports book. They have the double chance feature on there. Uh, kind of like this. Cam Young or Min Woo Lee to win at plus 750. So... I lied to you when I said I'm taking Min Woo Lee top five because I'm also taking I'm, I'm also taking Min Woo Lee to win. Something seems like manifesting destiny at this point. You and I both picked rookie last year. <laughs> both taking Min Woo this year. Uh, he's never played this golf course, but he bombs the ball like all hell. Uh, guys who have won here in the past: Bryson DeChambeau, Joaquin Neiman, Tony Finau, Taylor Pendrith. They've all played really well on this golf course. He's second in the field this week in driving distance. He's first in strokes gained off the tee. The only guy who's better than him so far this year is Tony Finau. He's long. He's straight. He's an incredible putter. He's not Asian. He's actually Australian, believe it or not. I love the Aussie to have a big win here at the Rocket Mortgage. Uh, he's won in the past, I'm pretty sure, um, uh, on tour. I'm almost positive of that. Uh, but another, another strong win for the 25-year-old to really kind of push him uh, on over the, actually no no this would be his first ever win on, on the PGA Tour if you when he went when he wins this week yeah his best finish was last year at the U.S. Open he finished tied for fifth that's crazy that's called T baby I love Min Woo this week hits the ball a country mile and puts it great so, so you I'm said you also owner. like Taylor Pendrith's style at this course yeah it fits so there's another uh, prop if you will it's a triple chance on the green sports book. Min Woo Lee, Alex Noren, or Taylor Pendrith to win at plus eight fifty. Alex Noren has played some really inspiring golf, although every time every time I pick him, he screws me over. Um, <laughs> but Noren doesn't hit the ball like super far, but he fits the style enough where you can you can get away with it because you're getting basically a, a double chance at that point. Um, well, I, or actually, you know what? If that's the case, I would just take a double chance if you can get Min Woo Lee and Taylor Pendrith uh, together. Also. Just for how, just for the hell of it, because I am, I'm all over this kid and want, want him to do well. Uh, Nick Benz made the cut. Do it for the boys. Come on the pod when you do make the cut. Yes, come on the pod. On the pod. And it's, and it's the Nick Benz uh, beer money picks of the week, powered by Ken. I, I would love to to give Nick Benz a beer and and say I'm so happy that they went to IUPUI 
and then and then I'm gonna so ask him, great. hey, can you spell ICOP? <laughs> and then say funny colors after. <laughs> me, me, me when Nick Benz uh, spells out, out yeah. face, doesn't realize doesn't realize what's going on. Uh, Neil Shipley is throwing out the first pitch at the Tigers game. Apparently, threw a absolute dead ball strike. Nice. That's who the Phillies are playing. So I'll have to see it's if it's done. out there. Freaking stud. KB, I'll uh, I'll give you the honors on the outro. Uh, make sure you guys are following us on the old socials. Uh, you can follow Steve at Real Steve McAvoy across the board. You can follow me at KBIZZL311 on Twitter, KBIZZLE11 on Instagram. Even though you never appear on Twitter when you search your name ever. It's so dumb. Thanks, Elon. Um, Freaking guy. Subscribe to the pod. Uh, also, I meant to tell you this uh, earlier. You guys were on the U.S. golf charts again. This no week. way! Yeah, I will pull up the uh, the positioning. Where Probably because Tyrrell Hatton uh, is watching us, <laughs> or, or, or 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 Patrick Reed is checking checking in to make sure we aren't shitting on them again. Yeah, he stopped commenting on YouTube videos and said, ah, "Let's <laughs> listen to the pod on audio. They won't know it's me." Um, <laughs> Let's see. Last week, you guys were peak position of 132. Not bad. It's pretty damn Not good. Bad. Not bad. Not bad. Um, so, yeah, subscribe to the pod. Um, it really does help uh, when you guys subscribe, when you leave five-star ratings and reviews. allows us to hit new milestones. lets us do more dope stuff with and for you guys. Uh, subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Underground Sports Philadelphia. We're at 808 subscribers right now. The goal is let's get to 900, let's get to 1,000, because uh, Steve and I are going to be doing a really cool project around the uh, the baseball season because we're planning on doing a trade deadline show. Hell yeah, bro. A trade deadline show, which is going to be a lot of fun. So, AKA the Mets Fire Sale Show. <laughs> <laughs> let's get Subscribe it. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Smash the like button. Ring the bell icon. Leave a comment down below everything we talked about on the episode. Check out all of our podcasts as well. Uh, across the board they are all on our youtube channel in video form and they're all available wherever you get your podcasts uh and of course steve you want to let them know about uh our friends at uh acorn hills yeah totally yo our guys over at acorn hills they're getting the absolute best apparel that you can basically get on the market uh at a fraction of the cost they um they've been absolutely killing it so far a lot of new awesome clothes Coming into the fold uh, over at Acorn Hills, I'm probably going to be buying my first set of apparel finally once the um, the savings opens up, and I'm very excited to get my hands on a nice quarter zip for the for the mid summer early fall season. Uh, changing clothing through conservation, Acorn Hills is going to absolutely get you styled out and decked out while giving you clothes that's not only good for the environment but also good for you. Look your best from the ground up, acornhillsco.com. Use code GITH15 for 15% off your next order. Also a code through the underground. I believe, I believe it's uh, is it underground 15 or USP 15? It's USP 15. Their there spring closeout sale is going on right now, too. It's some awesome stuff Hell yeah! Uh, that you won't want to miss out on before they turn over a new leaf, all pun intended, uh, and get some new gear in the store. That was good. That was really good. But yeah, the the spring closeout sale. They they just got hats back on. I'm looking at their website right now. The hats are back, which are sweet. Um, they they have some awesome stuff. And it's like... meant it's turn over a new <laughs> that, That's almost as good. And and they can tell you, we're watching Friends the other night, and uh, and it's the one scene where Tom Selleck uh, walks out into the living room and he goes, "Watch this," and he's holding these 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 uh, champagne champagne glasses. And in the show, he's a an eye doctor. And he walks out and he goes, who wants glasses? I literally dropped to the fucking floor. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, this is the funniest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. That's incredible. So turn over a new leaf. Who wants glasses? I'm dying. This is great. Yeah, check oh, out Acorn way, Hills also, there. No also, bad. polo and quarter zip for the 4th of July. Hopefully you can get on that and, uh, and, and look your best, again, from the ground up with Acorn Hills. The Betsy looks hot. The flags everywhere. Beautiful. The, the new personal favorite just on look alone, the Navigator Polo. Yep. It's got a bunch of RVs, a tent, and a grizzly bear on that bad boy. A bunch of fish. 
acorns, some boots. They're awesome. Like their gear is so unique and and one of a kind that you're not going to find it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, thanks for having me again. On it's fun how it always lines up that we do the same shows with each other every year on this show. It's always the Zurich. It's always the Rocket Mortgage. It's always... We just got to make we got to make a list of the ones that it is. So the Zurich Rocket Mortgage. I don't care if Ben is around for him. I got to be on that episode. <laughs> Well, we can give Ben the week off. <laughs> go, go, go and golf. <laughs> go do your craft. Go, go, go and golf like the uh, the simple man you are, and let the boys jump on the pod. Best of luck to Ben too. Uh, oh, well, I, I again have no idea what's going on with this result because because the problem is is with some of these tours they never get any of the like tracking um correct. So dying to know what's happening, and I just can't see it at all, unfortunately. But best of luck to Ben. We'll update you guys on Twitter once we hear back. Or Ben's probably going to call me crying, saying, oh, my God, I won. Oh, hopefully he does. Folks, thanks for tuning in. Episode 160 of the Get in the Hole podcast. For KB, I'm Steve Matt. Thanks for listening to Get in the Hole, the official golf podcast of Underground Sports Philadelphia. Catch us every week wherever you get your favorite podcasts, and be sure to like and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Getting the Whole Pod, and follow Underground Sports Philadelphia at Underground PHI. We'll see you next time, and remember, get in the hole.